morning. It's Wednesday, September the 2nd, and you're joining us live for Liberty University's Convocation. Before we start our time of worship, I wanted to introduce you to two of our worship collective members, Allie and Ben. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks, man. Uh, what is the song that we're going to be singing this morning? Uh, so the song is called Who You Say I Am uh, by Hillsong Worship. and it really Good morning. It's Friday, September the 4th, and you're watching us live for Liberty University's Convocation. I want to introduce you to one of our uh, worship collective members, Nate Diaz. Man, I just love you, buddy. You, I remember uh, the first time I ever watched you lead. You're now like a junior, yeah. you know, one of our upperclassmen leading us out all the time. But the first time I, I remember you leading worship was actually when we had an Easter weekend and we were leading the worship collective out of three teams yeah. locally, you know, at the Natural Bridge, about a uh, you know, hour away, and then we were leading domestically in Florida mm -hmm. for hurricane victims and a fundraiser there, and then internationally with you in a soccer stadium at a Franklin Graham Crusade. There was like 35, 40,000 people there. You were leading the set completely in Spanish, and I was, I was watching it on my phone, live stream, and just blown away by God's just anointing on your life. What was that experience like for you? It was incredible, you know, to be able to go um, and see a completely different side of the world, mm. like first and foremost, and then to see the impact of the gospel. Mm. Um, you can ask anybody on that team. And uh, although we did get to like participate at that huge stadium and it was awesome to lead worship there, I think the most impactful thing uh, was when we were just all at the shelter serving the people. Because um, that just gave us uh, such a unique and, and holistic view of the gospel of like, mm. man, this is what it's about, just getting yeah. lost people. Um, to hear the message of Jesus. So it was incredible. I loved it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I love that about your heart, man. You were leading worship at the homeless shelter in Colombia and you were leading worship at the soccer stadium in Colombia. And you were leading it in Spanish. You're not Colombian, you're Puerto Rican, yeah. right? And that is uh, just such a great just tool that God has given you, the, the ability to be able to, to lead in different languages. Uh, tell us about this particular song. Um, man, uh, what a anthem to sing at this time in America, at this time in the world where it seems like everything is uh, divided, right? Mm -hmm. And there's nothing in the middle, but uh, we're gonna be singing Jesus at the center. And um, I believe that, you know, all of the things that we are experiencing, you know, it's, there's a saying going around now that a lot of the hurt, a lot of the pain is just a symptom of the real sickness, which is sin. Mm -hmm. So at the center of it all is a heart issue. At the center of this all, um, after every, uh, you know, negative thing that a human can possess, at the center of it all is all sin. And so what's, what's the answer? And his name is Jesus. So that's what, that's what we're going to be singing about. And that's what we're going to be declaring over our hearts, over this nation, over our school, um, and over the world. Amen. So here it is, uh, Israel Hootens, uh, Jesus at the Center. center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, my Jesus, Jesus at center of it all, Jesus at the center of it all, from beginning to the end, it will always be, it's always been you, Jesus, Jesus, nothing else matters. Nothing 
That's not just a powerful song, but such a powerful prayer, just to come and bring our hearts to God and say, if there's anything that's out of alignment, recenter me, God. Put Jesus back into the very center of every single aspect uh, of my being. Our guest today is a ministry legend, someone who has been faithful in ministry for over 40 years, Pastor Johnny Hunt. Uh, Pastor Johnny was one of the pastors of one of the great churches uh, of our country, First Baptist Woodstock, for years. And today, uh, he serves as the Senior Vice President of Evangelism and Leadership for the North American Mission Board. He's a personal friend and a mentor to me and someone I've looked to for years as just an example of what it looks like to witness uh, with your life. Let's watch this together. Pastor Johnny, thanks so much for joining us. You're such a hero to me. I, I can't tell you what it's meant to me throughout the years to see you as a role model. And also just uh, every time you had me at your church, you were always not out of town. You were there sitting in the front row. You always invited, uh, you know, lost friends that you met through the week. You're such an example. And, and boy, you, you, you have just, you're just getting started. I mean, I got to tell you, uh, before we get going, uh, I have notes from long breakfasts, long lunches <laughs> with you where I sat and like wore out nine, ten napkins, went back, wrote them in my journal. Uh, and principles you taught me, sir, that I still apply in, in my life. And so before we get going, thanks for the, the testimony and the witness and the mentor you are in my life. Uh, well, how you doing? You, you doing well? I'm doing good. And that encourages me because I'm a big fan of yours. And I'll tell you what I often think. If God did indeed use me to make an investment in your life, mm. thank you for giving such a great return on the yeah. investment. We were just talking about how uh, the last time we had a long lunch, I was church planning. And man, I was I was drowning in church planning, like governance and elders and leaders. And I had so many questions. We sat at that seafood restaurant, I think, for three and a half, four hours. And you just went, calm down. Let me give you some advice. And it was so rich. It was just right out of scripture. And so I wanted to talk to you. I, I just really see you as an authority, um, probably more than anyone else I know on uh, on soul winning, on evangelism, on witnessing. Um, and that's certainly the role you play now as a senior VP uh, with mm -hmm. NAM. Uh, that is one of your focuses, equipping churches to do that work, right. uh, witnessing. But uh, can you give us your testimony? Because I want people to hear before they, they hear from an authority about evangelism, how this is very personal for you. Uh, yeah. Give us a little bit of your life story. And, and let me be quick to say that if I was downstairs in my other office, one of the uh, most prominent things that sticks out in my office is a little... Um, plaque of the address where I was raised in 6D Nesby Courts in a project. My dad checked out when I was seven, mm. left my mother with six children. She worked two jobs living in the project. We stayed in and out of trouble. When I turned 16, I dropped out of high school. I began to hang out at a pool hall. They asked me to work there some as a 16 year old. I ended up working there for the next four years. Many days I played pool for seven or eight hours. I became good. My life goal when I was 19 and 20 was to be a professional pool player. Many believe that are really, that made it real big, believe that the reason they're where they are is because I'm not ahead of them. Wow. That's what they say to this day. But I really was a good player and I hustled. So I did that in uh, just no purpose direction in life arrested on three different charges. I'm ashamed of all of that, but it's just who I was. I was uh, in the hood and kind of a hoodlum. And then somebody invited me to church. And that's why when I'd have you to preach, David, your heart for evangelism, I brought people. 85% mm -hmm. of the people that will ever come to faith in Jesus Christ were invited into a, a biblical-based church where they're going to hear gospel singing that's going to speak to their heart, and then a message and people praying and believing the gospel is still the power of God and the salvation. So somebody invited me to church, and I went maybe about three weeks, and the gospel penetrated my heart. Mm. The Bible says when the Spirit of God has come, he convicts of sin, righteousness, judgment to come. And I struggled, though. Can I hold out? You know, I didn't understand. I'd never owned a Bible. I'd never been to revival, never been to Sunday school, never been to a Sunday night service. Wow. But I was under wow. such conviction in a morning service I went back that night because the pastor said this. There's a young man here. It's apparent God's dealing with him. Let's pray as a congregation. God will bring him back tonight and save him. Wow. The miracle is it snowed that night. So everybody talks about the <laughs> snowy Sunday night. That's, you know, people talk about that. 
And uh, I went because there was such a deep need and I trusted Christ. And, you know, Spurgeon said when he got converted, he lost 80% of his vocabulary. God really did change, you know, the language from the pool room. And, and it, was, it was not long at all that I began to sense God wants to do something with my life. Went back to night school. Hmm. After three attempts, three attempts, I finished the GED. And then I got in Gardner with College Southeastern Seminary. And, and you just uh, don't say it other than anybody that needs to be encouraged. I served as president of Southern Baptist Convention. Right largest evangelical body to ever exist on North American soil. The only reason I say that I did that is if God can take me from where I just said I came from, it's not really about what I bring to the table at salvation. It's what God placed in me at salvation. God is no respecter of persons. And I know your background. I mean, God can use any of us. I don't know that he was looking for uh, a Muslim to lead out in evangelism at Liberty University. I know, exactly. You know, so so, it, so it's all about, you know, what made the difference is, you know, sometimes people say, I just don't feel like I have that much to offer. The bottom line is, in the context of salvation and service, I really don't have anything to offer except my sin, and he gives me his righteousness, and his disposition and nature in me has the potential to do anything God would want to do. But wow. after he brought me to Christ, I was the first Christian in my family and God really broke my heart for my family. And, you know, sometimes we pray, oh, Lord, save our families or send somebody to them. Then I, I want to pose this question. Who could possibly love them more than you? So that's where we need to share. And it's not how equipped we are. Mm. It's, it's how passionate and burdened we are. We don't need more resources. We need to plug into the resource of God, the Holy Spirit, and just tell our story. Be a witness of what Christ has done for you. So speaking of your powerful testimony, define evangelism for us. Is it more formulaic? Is it more testimonial? Is it the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony? Like you just shared your story. It's right. just captivating to see how far God's brought you. Yeah. How often do you share your story? How often are you not? You're just so natural at it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on just what is evangelism? Yeah, I tell my story, but I always tell my story, but I wrap it with the gospel because the gospel is the power of God of salvation, not Johnny Hunt's story. Right. And so it's real important. So a lot of times I'm on a plane and I tell guys this, while I'm talking to a guy, I may say, I just want to remind you, hey, God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten son. Somebody said, well, why would you throw that in there? You were really on a roll about your story <laughs> because it's the gospel. I want to get the gospel in there. The wages of sin is death, you know. Yeah. So it's really evangelism is literally the sharing of the good news. And the good news mm -hmm. is the gospel. You know, uh, I was out at Dallas the other day and, and, you know, First Baptist Church Dallas, just by its reputation, has so many viewers. Mm -hmm. and I don't know how long they stay on, but basically the morning I was on, they said 210,000 people. So Dr. Jeffrey said, would you do me a favor? When you finish, would you look at the camera and as quickly as you can, but clearly, concise, compelling, give the gospel. Here's the gospel to me, evangelism. Jesus Christ is willing to forgive me of my sins. I mean, in the sin, wage of sin is death. So, I mean, he will forgive my past, present, future sins. So when I come to Jesus Christ, number one, sin's forgiven. Number two, God places his nature and disposition in me. God mm -hmm. comes to live inside of me. The life that I feel I'm not going to be able to live, I can't. That's why he lives in me. He's going to live his life through me. And then last of all, he has forgiven me my sins. He's come to live in me. And this is good for a kid that his dad checked out. I will never leave you and never forsake you. But he also gives me the gift of everlasting life. I mean, so really, I mean, less than a minute, I've just told that's the, the crux of it. But then I could talk about it all day, but in from different texts. But sin's forgiven. God lives in me and I'm going to live forever. Um that's, that's the evangelism. That's the gospel, telling that story. Right. And as far as telling that story, obviously this pandemic season has given us some disadvantages, the way we're gathering, maybe some of the things that were afforded to us that are not. But it's also given us a lot of advantages, right? Talk to us about witnessing through this pandemic season. Have you, right. I mean, I know you yourself are just a soul winner, but then how, how are you yeah. equipping churches right now to seize the moment, to not waste the pandemic? Yeah. Yeah, one of the things I'm trying to do, and that's a good way to say, because here's what I want to say to them. Will I be better when this is over? 
You mm. know, and since we don't know exactly what it's all about, it's worldwide. But can we just be reminded of Joseph's story that whatever Satan meant for evil, because if 50% of the church is out and may not come back, that is not good. Right. But can God bring what Satan meant for evil? Can God bring for good? Could there be a purging right now? Could this be the the threshold of a great awakening? Just what y'all are sensing and seeing and the reason we're doing this interview right now. But we uh, we went online and I did virtual training. So someone can go to HoosierOne.com, virtual training, and I literally not only preach about the, one of the most passionate messages God ever gave me on personal soul winning. Mm-hmm. And by the way, Jesus was a soul winner. Mm-hmm. It, in John chapter 1, Jesus led John, who would become John the Apostle, led him to Christ himself. When we get to heaven and say, hey, man, so you camped out on the Isle of Patmos. How did you come to know Christ in the first place? He's going to say this. Uh, Christ witnessed to me and led me to himself. And then you're going to say, hey, Philip, tell me. And Andrew, Andrew was brought to Jesus by Jesus, which brings me to this point. Jesus never asked us to do anything he was not already doing. Mm -hmm. He modeled it for us. So first of all, we're training people. And then we're giving examples like, get a little ahead of myself, but when you talk about the culture of evangelism, Mm -hmm. Uh, that comes by telling the stories like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sharing a text and I say, it reminds me this week. But what my wife and I, we have, we moved into a home. So we had three families we didn't know. If they'll go to NAMB.net slash evangelism, and they've probably seen this, but bless every home. Mm. You can click on bless every home and type in your address. It'll tell you who your five closest neighbors are and more if you want to know. And it normally even gives numbers, their age, their children, their wow. occupation. Wow. Bless every home. We put it on the website. It's free. All right. So I've got three neighbors. I have four. Three I, I, I've not met. I was new. COVID hit. So text them and said, hey, one of them was a pilot, just retired with Delta. I'd have a lot in common with him because I've probably flown behind him, you know, <laughs> and, and, and he found right. out he goes to Argentina. I've been 22 times. So anyway, I said, um, hey, um, Bob, my name's Johnny. I live next to you at 4072. Listen, Janet and I make it a priority to be good neighbors. Mm. I know we're in COVID. Can I, can I come over? You can be at your garage or porch, wherever you're comfortable. Well, they were comfortable like us, so they just sort of came down. And we just said, boy, we, we just want to meet our neighbors and be good neighbors. And and I said, so uh, we, we bought y'all dinner. I bought them, I mean, like an 18-pound pork roast <laughs> and had this professional to cook them. And then in the book, in the a little bag, a nice bag my wife put together, I put a, a nice high-end devotional that we do with Thomas Nelson, mm. 52 weeks, and then my life story from the pool room to the pulpit, 27 pages, how Jesus changed my life. And then a nice gift from Woodstock, like not the church, but the Woodstock, like mugs that say Woodstock, Georgia. Right. And we just said, hey, we're here. Here's our mobile. If, if we could ever uh, do anything for you, every one of them reached back and said, we cannot believe this. We feel terrible. We didn't come to y'all. Y'all came to us, all of them. And by the way, one of the ladies was Jewish, and she was the first one to thank me for the pork. Wow. So that was, a, that was a blessing. I thought, oh, my God, when I found out she was Jewish, I thought, oh, I should have brought her a turkey. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, we, we yeah, so let me tell you, I was preaching at Woodstock like two weeks after that. I sent every one of them a link and said, hey, um, y'all all know I've pastored for years and now I've transitioned. I said, but tomorrow I'm speaking, and maybe you'll be interested in this subject. Can good come out of trials? Mm. And I said, and I'm preaching from my favorite book in the Bible, James, just kind of connecting. Now, I, I want to be honest. I didn't hear back from a single one. That doesn't mean they didn't watch me. And then we waited about a month, and I texted them again and said, I hope you're good. Hey, Pastor Johnny, you are so kind. Bob and I were just talking much we like you. Can't wait for this to be over so we can all get together and grill in the yards. But then I said, hey, wow. listen, again, want to be good neighbors. And that's a real trying time for families. Uh, Janet and I spend time praying every day. If you have any need whatsoever in your immediate family or friends, please text us anytime Mm. and know we'll pray. Again, I haven't heard anything from, but I'm I'm still pressing in. You know what I mean? I feel like if somebody to say, hey, what's it like living beside that Johnny Hunt? I would like to think they'd say, good night. He's done for us what we've done for him. He brought us a meal and hey, Mm. he wrote a book, gave us a copy. And, you know, so we're, we're working so we can you know, move in during this time. Right. 
And, uh, and, and there, you know, I, I'm traveling a little since June, so that puts me in that environment on the plane. The only thing you aren't sitting close to them, but they're across the aisle. You can talk to them. So just look for opportunities. But then you're uh, here. Here's where we're missing it. Now think about this, David. When Jesus um, really saves John the Apostle, Andrew and Philip, hmm. guess what he did? Andrew did what? Went and found his brother, Simon Peter. Now here's a great one line. God may use you to reach one, but the one you reach may reach thousands. Wow. So Andrew touched him, but he went after family. Andrew modeled going after family. Hmm. Philip, when Philip got converted, he went after his friend Nathaniel. And here's cool. Nathaniel was a skeptic. He's the one that penned these words or coined these words. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So he's a little skeptic, but you know what he did? He didn't say, oh, well, we have prophecy. He didn't, he didn't say any of that. You know what he said? Um, hey, come and see. <laughs> mm-hmm. Hey, why don't, why don't you come one night to the, to the campus with me for this service? My pastor is preaching over here. Come and hear him. And they came and saw, and Jesus changed his life. Now, what he was amazed in is that Jesus knew it. And you know what? It doesn't matter who we bring. Guess what? Jesus knows them. Uh, people used to say, man, God had your number. No, 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 no. God knows your name. But we've got to get the students and the people in our church to realize people that are lost without God, they've got to be honest about this. Jesus spoke of hell three times a heaven. They will die and go to hell without the gospel. No one goes to heaven mm. without the righteousness of Christ, and they'll never hear about the righteousness of Christ without evangelism which is the sharing of the good news, the gospel. You just touched on something that I love to ask you about. Why do you think people aren't? What's the apprehension? I mean, anyone listening to you as a Christian is reminded of the hour they first believed. They might not have a pool hall to the pulpit. They might have something else, but they're reminded of the power of the gospel in their own life and how someone dared to share it with them, whether it was a godly grandmother or Sunday Mm -hmm. school teacher or campus pastor, somebody. But... What, what do you think is stopping people? Is it fear? Is it apprehension? Is it lack of knowledge in the scriptures? Why are people not sharing the gospel as, nearly as much in personal evangelism? Research has shown we can't, you know, dance around it. It is fear, you know, mm. it's fear. Fear of being rejected when it's not us being rejected. It's Christ. It's his message. Mm. Sometimes there's a fear of reputation. Ah, oh, what would they think about me? And, and so what we're doing, we're, we become self-centered instead of other-centered. So if we were other centered, we'd never think about, and we wouldn't really care that much about, hey, he came over and told me how bad I was and how good he is. But let me give you the word God put in my heart since I'm doing this every day and I, I just really think for it a lot. It's a it's a vision. And let me mm-hmm. let me define what I mean by vision. If I could get every student at Liberty University to think vision, what you see. We see people in their actualities and it scares us he don't want to hear the gospel did you hear what word he just used have you seen how much he drinks so they look at him in actuality and think ain't no way buddy and that's why they say it'd be a miracle if he got saved not a miracle if anybody gets saved <laughs> all right but what they need to do is see them in possibilities who modeled that jesus jesus said you are simon that's pretty cool and like yeah. well of course i know who i am He said, but you shall be called Cephas. So do a study. Simon means wavering one. Mm -hmm. Cephas means rock. Jesus Christ sees us not for who we are. He sees us for who we can become. If we could start thinking like, man, wouldn't it have been cool if we'd have been the one to invite that 16-year-old boy to go hear Mordecai Ham in Charlotte, North Carolina uh, so many years ago, little fellow named Billy Graham, Somebody invited Billy Graham to that crusade. Right. And God changed his life. And and wouldn't it be, I don't know who brought him or who really encouraged him, but ever who did, I wonder if they encouraged many others, if that was the only one. But the one they touched, the one they invited, Billy Graham, touched more people, they say, than anyone thus far that has lived in humanity has wow. preached to more people eyeball to eyeball than anyone that has lived in humanity. And so, man, who would ever dream? If we really believed that the person in their actuality could become what we'd like to see them become in possibility, 
they would leave while you're sharing. They mm -hmm. when they start watching this, they they start going. I say, where y'all going? We're going after them, man. I yeah. mean, what they could become, and I would like to be the one that that would share with them. Uh, certainly, certainly, the win in winning people is in the obedience. We just, we, we, we're obedient and we just do what we are supposed to do, which is to go out to all the world and to share the good news of, of Christ with them. Mm -hmm. And it might be that we don't get to see that come into fruition, right? It might be that we're the ones putting the seed in. We might be the ones doing the watering. Someone else might come in and, and, and be able to see it later. Mm -hmm. But the win is in the obedience. Yeah. And I love what you just said. I've never thought of... Uh, evangelism that way. We actually define around here honor as seeing someone in their fullness, seeing them in there their pitfalls and their potential. When yes. Jesus sees the woman at the well, he sees her in all of her reality, but he also sees her in the potential of what she can. He sees Absolutely. Peter, not just as a fisher of uh, fish, but a fisher of men. He sees Jesus when he saw you, didn't see Pool Hall Johnny. Mm -hmm. He saw like someone who's going to motivate 15,000 students this morning to share yeah. the gospel. And so it's so good to be reminded of that. Uh, last question. Talk to us about creating a culture of soul winning, you know, creating a culture of evangelism. Um, we want to be more than ever intentional about going out and, and actually having gospel conversations. I, I believe that you witness with your life and mm -hmm. use words whenever necessary, but yeah. <laughs> words are necessary, you know? <laughs> They're so, necessary. So, so talk to us about how we can become, as a university, uh, as community groups, you know, we have 1,100 community groups here, mm. um, more evangelistic, where seven guys say, hey, why don't, why don't we go out today and be intentional about sharing the gospel? Mm -hmm. How did you create that kind of culture at Woodstock? Yeah, uh, you've got to model it. You must model it. No, no other way. So, for instance, I, I'm just constantly preaching, and, and I'll just tell you what I would do. I'd get up, and you're talking about you were there, and I always had guests with me. Every time. And I really did. And you could call Jeremy Morton right now, and he would tell you, that it is true that he shared with the church recently that he was under conviction because he never came to hear me preach that he didn't have to move down a few seats because <laughs> he couldn't sit beside me because I already had these lost men sitting, sitting there with me. I just came back. I've been out on a, a, a major lake right at South Carolina with 11 men, mm -hmm. Troy Sadowski, NFL. I led him to faith in Jesus Christ. We walked five and a quarter miles in heels yesterday. The dude's like six, five. He's <laughs> lost a lot of weight. He's down to like 243. He's massive. And I've got his testimony on a video. But uh, And then there's Randy Bach, major stockholder. I mean, he owns a major company. 25 years ago, I led him to faith in Jesus Christ. Wow. I mean, these guys have been radically changed by the gospel, but their fruit from early, early, early days labor. But, but I'm constantly, when I'm preaching, I'm telling the stories of, of who I witnessed to. If someone were to go to lunch, dinner with me tonight, uh, somebody would come to the table to wait on us. And in a moment, I'd say this, hey, my wife and I are getting ready to return thanks. Can we pray for you about anything? Mm. I had a preacher one time say to me, do you ever see results? I said, are you kidding? Are you kidding? All right, tell you what else my pastor just said. So Woodstock, one of the largest churches in America, here's what he said. Pastor, I wondered why I'm not winning anybody to Jesus in recent months. I spend all my time with the body of Christ. Hey, I love the body of Christ. Mm -hmm. But if you're not intentional, so let's talk about my schedule when COVID is over. Saturday night when I'm in Woodstock, Georgia, if you're in town and you want to hang out with me, you're going to have to join me at the Dixie Speedway. Why? Over 5,000 people, I'm their chaplain. I've got my life story, picking up a free copy, free Bibles. And in the Bibles, I've been there 25 years. I've got the stories of the people I've led to Christ. So when you're reading wow. through John, you stop and you read, hey, here's um, Bill. Bill tells how he came to Jesus. And then we've got Jesus videos. And so I do the invocation and I just love on them. But I've been going so long when I walk through there now, David, they say, hey, hey, uh, Reverend, can I see you for a minute? And they come over and they give me uh, a prayer request and I say, tell me more about it. I may even actually go try to visit their loved one in the hospital mm. pre-COVID. But then I'll say this, tell me your name now. Hey, you and your family, boy, I see you're really concerned about your sister. Are you are you attending church anywhere? Just whatever you're comfortable with. Now, you know, you know, Brother Johnny, I used to go and we do it. But here's what I'm doing to really create a culture. Somebody comes up to me regularly. Hey, would you pray for my mother? 
Mm. Okay, I sure will. And I've got it. My journal now is in my phone. It, it's, that's cool. You can have it all there. So regardless where I am, I've got it out uh, eight days. You know, I've got every day and then Sunday through because there's things I want to pray about every day. My wife, my children, and then sometimes real special needs till there's a breakthrough. All right. So I, I put their name in there. Um, hey, how's she doing? Really talking. And I'll just say this. Is your mother a believer? And here's the, uh, the most obvious answer I get. Um, I, I really don't know. I'm not sure. Now, I'm going to give an answer, and I don't mean for it to be offensive, but I'm, I'm fearful it is more accurate than not. They don't know because they never ask. Mm. See, I have to say, Mama, Mama, uh, you know, Jesus changed my life. Mama, did Jesus ever change your life? Now, what they may be shocked at, they may say, you know, we really got wayward. You know, your daddy started drinking, but you need to know that when I was 19 years old, and they may tell you the most glorious, life-changing story and then they maybe start weeping about how they trailed off, hmm. but how they want to come back. But you don't know unless you ask. And it's a genuine concern, but God forbid, my mom's in heaven. I led my mom to the Lord. My mom joined my church when I was in Wilmington, hmm. and she died while I was her pastor at 60 wow. years old, congestive heart failure. But I know my mom was converted. I mean, I know she loved God. Life changed. I talked to my sister this morning. I led my sister Mary to the Lord, my sister Barbara. I led my brother wow. Norman to the Lord, two years older. He's been pastoring 10 miles north of me for the last 30 years. So I led him to Christ, and he's a Baptist preacher. And I've, if I see him in actuality, let me tell you what he was. He was um, um, greedy. He was uh, headstrong, mm. real bad temper. He'd fight and drop a hat and furnish the hat, uh, drank <laughs> like a fish. But yet religious, slipped in church right. every now and he'd say to me, I know you're going to church. And I said, no, I'm just talking about church. Hear my story. Christ is in my life. I'm a different man. I think different. My want-tos have been changed. So I led him to Christ and baptized Norman Ray Hunt. And for 30 years, he has served at uh, Hopewell Baptist Church in Canton, Georgia, 10 miles from me. Now, I wouldn't tell that story at Woodstock about where he was, I'd tell him that he was 150 miles north, said he wouldn't go to his church. <laughs> but, but I mean, really, I mean, who who could love Norman more than Johnny? And by the way, if Jesus changed my life, who should know it more than my immediate family that watched me gamble? Yeah. Went, you know what I said to my mom to get her to go to church? Hey, mother, have you noticed you haven't had to go to the jail since I got saved? She had to pick me up for stealing. She picked me up for fighting and she picked me up for drunk driving and totaling my sister's car. Wow. So my mom had been to the jail three times at night to get me out of jail, but she's never had to go to the jail since Jesus came in. Wow. And my mom said that night, do I have time to change clothes? And I tell this story so people can think about their own mom. My mom was sitting beside me in church, the choir saying, Oh, why not tonight? And, and, you know, they said, bow your head. And I bowed, but I asked the people, and we do, do you ever peek? <laughs> and, and, and if somebody's beside you, if they start to move, can't you feel that movement? Right. And I'll never right. forget as long as I live, David, looking and watching Mama slip out the aisle and go down front and surrender her life to Jesus Christ. And, you know, she's been with the Lord 35 years. But guess what? I will never forget. How do I know? about the songs and all, because I've been telling them ever since the night it happened. Wow. Here's one so statement powerful. I'll close with, unless you've got something you want to add to it. Here's what I say. I say the night I met Jesus was the most significant decision I've ever made in my life. Mm -hmm. How under heaven could I make the most significant decision I've ever made in my life and never tell my friend and family? How? It's How? too good. It's too good to keep yeah, to yourself. Is. People know where I work. People know what I do. People know what I love. People probably know a lot about what I don't like, but they've got to know about my relationship mm. with Jesus. We always say convinced people convince people. No, that's you good. Know, and, and I'm telling you, I just, I see it. I mean, just even though we're physically, you know, not in the same room, you, you know, you're, you're in Georgia, I'm here in Virginia. <laughs> I just sense that you, this is real for you. You know, like, this is, again, something that's very personal for you. And so because God really impacted your life, because someone um, invited you, you're inviting others. And so this is just going downstream, 
and what God has first done in your life. Can I, can I just ask you to do me a favor, Pastor Johnny? I, I, I've got to believe some of our students are watching Convo this morning, hearing this, and they're thinking about their mom. They're thinking about their best friend. They're thinking about how here in, in a little while they're going to go back home, uh, you know, and maybe, maybe some of our students even now are watching online and they've been quarantined and they're now stuck with a family member and they're realizing God has given them an opportunity like they've never had before. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's listening right now and they just lack the courage, they're, just, they're watching you and they're like, he's a professional witnessing <laughs> machine. I, I'm going to be terrified. What if I'm rejected? What if this makes the relationship even worse? I've been inconsistent. And so they're going to bring that up because I just, I blew a gasket the other day. Yeah. Will you just pray for someone right now who, who's, who's sensing by hearing you that um, they need to share the gospel. They need to begin to take steps towards that conversation. Uh, will you pray for them right now? I will. I'd love to. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, uh, I just join with David in lifting that student to you that really has something on their heart that I often pray for. Lord, lay some soul upon my heart and love that soul through me. And I thank you that even though I'm imperfect, the one I will talk to them about has never failed. He's blameless, spotless. Help them to keep their eyes on the perfection of the one we present. And God, burden them. Um, they that sow in tears mm -hmm. shall reap in joy. Uh, give them a burden uh, for, for their loved one, even if it was like their house was on fire and they've never been to fire school training, but they can use a hose. Help them to use whatever means of simply giving the story, of telling the John 3, 16 verse and believing that God will use the power of the spoken word to speak into their life. And I just pray that you would continue what you're starting. Thank you for giving David a passion to see those young champions for Christ on fire for the Lord. And thank you to the founder of the school, Jerry Falwell Sr., knocked on every door in Lynchburg in his early days. Such a passion for souls. May that legacy live on, and may that passion be ours for those that don't know you. I pray that when the weekend's over, that many will say, God, use this in my life, and, and then give the name of the person that's on their way to heaven. We love you, and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I love you, Pastor. Thanks for the I way you model you, it. And look forward to seeing you in Panama City Beach, somewhere down there on 30A, soon. Yes, soon and very soon. I love you, yeah. Pastor. Thanks again. Take care, buddy. Bye-bye. Thanks again for joining us. Remember, not just to hear these truths about being a soul winner, about being a witness, but to submit to them. I hope that you've been inspired and God has put someone on your mind, someone on your heart that you can share the gospel with, even maybe this weekend. Don't forget that uh, Campus Community Sign Up, uh, where you can register for a seat, begins on Monday morning. The past two campus communities, they've quickly uh, been taken every single seat. And so you can register for that. We only seat about 5,000 in the stadium, so you'll want to grab your tickets as soon as possible. And also, remember to wear your mask and to be socially distant as we kind of look after one another during this pandemic season. God bless you. We'll see you next week.